All right, today I'm gonna to be doing some meal prep and I thought I'd take you along with me again. And in the background, we're gonna be listening to a podcast episode from Joanne Ozug or Ozug. I'm not sure exactly how you pronounce her last name. One of you in the comments recommended that I listen to her um, in relation to pregnancy and, and her story about going through pregnancy and trying to do the carnivore diet. And so I took your advice and I actually listened to a about a 45 minute interview with her on nutrition with judy which is what i was actually listening to in the video that you're gonna see of me doing the meal prep so you're gonna see me kind of reacting to their conversation a little bit but in lieu of posting that one which is really long i thought i would just give you some background from one of Joanne's podcast episodes that's related to her carnivore um, journey and then pregnancy because it's almost it's very 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 similar to mine i got um, I was on a carnivore for about 11 months before I got pregnant and I it was like a night and day change. I was um, averse to everything. I had meat aversion. Every type of food just smelled, tasted disgusting. And the only thing that sounded good to me was those bland, starchy carbs like potatoes, white potatoes, plain, was really all I wanted for like the first two trimesters. And so I just, I found a lot of similarities with her struggle um, to be the same as mine when I was pregnant. And so thank you for the recommendation because that was, that's really nice to hear. I haven't heard anyone really discuss that at all, having been carnivore before pregnancy and then trying to get back onto it. So it's about a 15 minute podcast episode. And so I'm gonna play that in the background today while I'm prepping my ground beef for the day and cooking breakfast. Um, I'm going to be breaking up that 10 pound roll into a few smaller portions and seasoning those with different seasonings so that I can prepare those for my little one and my fiance who, you know, eat meat based as well. But we, I also make some rice and, and we have fruit and a few other things around um, that I don't personally eat right now. So I'm going to keep about half of it with salt for myself and then the other half I'm going to break up into smaller seasoned chunks in the gallon Ziploc bags. So I hope you enjoy the podcast episode in the background. I'll put links to the Nutrition with Judy interview below because that one's also really good if you haven't heard that one. I really enjoyed it. And then um, links to Joanne's um, profiles and stuff as well so you can check her out. All right, thanks for watching. I'm Joanne Ozug and you are listening to The Road to Carnivore, episode 21. Let's say you're at a birthday party. It's time to cut the cake. Everyone gathers around. And you can't help but notice what a beautiful cake it is. It's quite obvious that it's a custom cake. And you come to find out that it's from a bakery you know. This bakery is run by one of the best pastry chefs in the country. And you know that they don't just buy butter to use in their award-winning cakes. No. They whip their own butter and buttermilk from fresh cream that they get daily from the local farm. You've tasted their cake in the past, and you can remember raving countless times in conversation that their cake is the best cake you've ever had. It is so good. But you're doing carnivore. You've decided that you only eat meat. So when the host comes by to offer you a piece, you say no. But in your head, you wish that you were eating cake like everyone else, and you think to yourself, I bet they're really enjoying it. In this situation, you are putting a huge strain on yourself by having what I call an affection for food. In the last episode, I talked about getting back to carnivore partway through my pregnancy after my nausea went away. But what I didn't discuss there is how hard that was. Not so much in a physical sense, my body was thrilled to get back to this way of eating. But I struggled with the addictive emotional eating side of it. I got to a point where though I was doing carnivore again with 100% compliance, I was doing it with so much reluctance. I was having a ton of FOMO and feeling upset about the foods I was no longer eating, even though I chose to change my eating and was relieved to have my back pain and digestive issues and other physical ailments go away so quickly. Eventually, I realized that the reason I was experiencing these mixed feelings is because I had redeveloped an affection for non-carnivore foods during the first half of my pregnancy. Just because you start doing carnivore again and successfully get back on the wagon with your eating, that doesn't mean this affection goes away. 
the affection doesn't go away until it's actively addressed. The purpose of this episode is to bring your attention to that because I have found that most people are unaware of this happening in their own lives. I had no idea this was going on in my life until a few months ago when I was in the car listening to a spiritual development podcast. This podcast was not about food, but the parallels it shared with food and the situation I was in were astonishing. So before we discuss this topic further, I want to read some of this excerpt to you. The excerpt shared on the podcast comes from the book, The Introduction to Devout Life, written by St. Francis de Sales on page 45. And it says, All the Israelites departed from the land of Egypt, but not all of their hearts had departed from the land of their bondage. Therefore, in the wilderness, many of them murmured at the fact that they did not have the onions and meat of Egypt. In like manner, there are penitents who forsake sin, failing to lose the desire for it. In other words, they truly intend to sin no more, but their hearts are marked with a kind of reluctance to deny themselves and abstain from the miserable pleasures of sin. Their hearts renounce sin and depart from it, but for all that, they do not cease to look back towards such sins. Such penitents abstain from sin, like sick men who avoid the foods that doctors tell them not to eat, lest they suffer death. However, they find this unpleasant and talk about these forbidden foods, discussing whether they might perhaps have them. Perhaps they at least smell them and judge that those who do eat them are happy. Thus, these weak and faint-hearted penitents abstain from sin for a time, but they sorrow at the state of affairs. They would willingly sin and not be damned. They speak of sin with a kind of satisfaction and relish and believe that those who commit such sins are happy. Then it says, you must not only forsake sin itself, but must also cleanse your heart from all desires for it. Indeed, besides the danger of relapsing, these wretched passions will perpetually enfeeble and depress your spirit. Souls that have set aside sin itself, but still have these desires and pine for sin, may in my opinion be compared to sickly and pale people who are not ill strictly speaking, though all of their actions are marked by a kind of sickness. They eat without relish, sleep without rest, laugh without delight, and drag themselves along instead of walking with an upright and steady pace. When I first listened to this, my jaw literally dropped because I could finally see what was happening. I was doing carnivore again from a place of discipline, knowing it's what my body needed. But I was also lamenting the loss of the foods that I'd eaten in that first trimester. And my brain was constantly trying to come up with reasonable excuses for eating things that really had no place in my life anymore. Doing carnivore fueled by discipline is possible but it's also incredibly exhausting and depressing. I remember being so confused because I was pleased that I was back to carnivore again, and yet I felt so unhappy about it. If you're going to eat this way long-term from a place of joy and peace, affection for non-carnivore foods must be addressed. You have to rein in the natural dispositions of the lizard brain, because I don't believe that carnivore is sustainable if this kind of affection exists in your heart and mind. So what exactly causes this affection, this excessive fondness for foods like cake? In part, there is absolutely a physiological component. When I was unable to stomach my beloved meats and had to rely on bland starchy carbs to get me through that first trimester, even though I had a very negative view of those foods and thought, oh my gosh, this is terrible, I need to stop eating crackers as soon as possible, physiologically, my body was responding positively to those carbs because that's what our body does to the majority of non-carnivore foods. Fortunately, this physiological attachment usually goes away on its own after a month or so of doing carnivore. But the bigger cause of affection is mental, and it relates to the package deal evaluation that I talk about in episode 15. If you're doing carnivore because you've decided that you don't want the health consequences of eating cake, but you still find yourself longing for it, then what's happening is you're picking out certain aspects of the package deal the good parts, and separating them from the whole. In the birthday cake story I told you at the beginning, in your head, you've decided you don't like something, that you're not going to eat cake because ultimately you don't want the consequences, but you're letting yourself like it in your heart. You don't want to be divided like this and have these opposing forces fighting within. You have to be intentional about your thoughts. Your brain's natural disposition is to desire stimulating foods but you can address that desire by calling to mind all the knowledge you've gained about the destruction these foods do to your body. This eventually changes your thinking. 
When I initially started noticing the difficulty I was having getting back to carnivore midway through the pregnancy, one of the first things I did was go back and listen to this very podcast to remind myself of the things I'd learned but surely had forgotten. And it was particularly amusing to listen back to episode 17, Letting Go of Food with Freedom, which I published over a year before today's episode and just a few months before my pregnancy. What was amusing to me is you can truly hear what a good place I was in. When I wrote that episode, I was at a place in my carnivore journey where I truly had no remaining affection for non-carnivore foods. I literally talked about how I want to indulge in cookies and hot chocolate every Christmas, just for nostalgia's sake, but I knew that I didn't want to eat those foods anymore because the experience was far too miserable. And I was actually sad about that, even though it was also wonderful I'd gotten to that point. Listening to that episode was encouraging because I remembered that place. And though it would take some work, I knew I could get back there again. Not long after that day I was in the car, I was in meditation after a rough day of trying to change my eating patterns. And I was shown this imagery of a brick wall surrounding me that had turned into a crumbled pile of rubble. I understood in that moment that I had built that wall over my carnivore journey, brick by brick, with all of these little bits of effort that I made toward having better health. I'd read this study here. I'd resolve some binge behavior there. I'd work on one of these podcast episodes or a newsletter or read a book on nutrition. Staying immersed in these health-oriented activities was what made up all these little bricks in my wall. And that wall protected me from the crazy modern food environment we live in. We are bombarded with food advertisement and suggestions that we should eat. You have to walk through a gauntlet of candy bars anytime you want to check out at the store. You cannot go to the movies without smelling popcorn. If you want to go to the mall to buy some clothes, you're going to run into the smell of Mrs. Field's cookies or Auntie Anne's pretzels wafting down the hallway. Out in the wild in everyday life, that wall is pinged again and again and again. I could see that if I don't spend a little time every day to nourish my boundary, my wall, my motivation, my why, then that constant pinging starts wearing that wall down until it eventually crumbles. I knew very clearly in this meditation that this had happened to me during the pregnancy. Because I could not keep meat down during the first trimester, I had to deviate from carnivore. And I remember the first few times it was a huge deal. After nearly two years of mostly carnivore eating, It was incredibly strange, but then it slowly became less and less strange. And as I let the normal ways of the parties and gatherings and outings trickle back into my life because I thought, what difference does it make? I can't do carnivore right now anyway. It all became normal. And then I had no brick wall left. So then every time some normal food opportunity came my way, which was all the time, I was directly vulnerable to those things. And I very often participated in them until I came back to carnivore again. Your brick wall is either being strengthened or it's breaking down. This is true of structures in general. Think about your house. Wind, rain, sun, all sorts of elements from the outside are constantly breaking down the exterior. And if you don't work to maintain that structure, it will eventually fall apart. To some degree, this was probably inevitable in the context of the pregnancy. But this idea is just as relevant to any time you deviate from carnivore for any other reason whether it's a planned deviation for the holidays or an accidental binge. Each additional time you deviate will start to feel more and more normal. And once you start tasting those foods again, your brain will respond to the dopamine fireworks, bringing back that affection for food right along with it. You have to expect that this kind of response will happen and be ready to counter it. I actually like to use the same metaphor of the brick wall and imagine that any time I deviate, It's like I'm taking a sledgehammer to some of those bricks. Whereas every time I immerse myself in the teachings and principles that support this way of eating, that's the equivalent of taking fresh mortar and adding a new level of bricks to that wall, making it harder for the outside world to get in. Now, I want to address the elephant in the room here, a complaint that I often hear lamenting the effort that is required to keep up healthy eating in our lives. I totally get this. There are times when I get tired of having to fight our food environment all the time. Not just for myself, but even for my kids who come home from school every single week with candy or cupcakes because it was someone's birthday. Sometimes I get angry at how exhausting it is to keep the outside world's influence out of my life, out of my family's lives. But if you do nothing, you will conform to the world around us because that's what's easiest and most convenient. The path of least resistance 
is the standard American diet. And the standard American diet has given us the most diseased and unhealthy human population in history. It takes effort to do something different. And I remind myself that I'd rather put up a fight than succumb to the disease-causing eating norms of our society. The good news is that once you get the wall built, it's nowhere near as difficult to maintain as when you're building it in the first place. A lot of it becomes habit, and that's when things get a lot easier. As you start to bring awareness to all of the little thoughts you have throughout the day, you will start changing your mindset little by little. This is the process of whittling down a rekindled affection for food. Notice where you might be reminiscing about the good parts of eating indulgent foods without acknowledging their cost to your health and well-being. Then counter those thoughts by getting back into the literature or reminding yourself how nice it is to no longer have to take your thyroid medication or how much better life is without gastritis burning off the lining of your esophagus. When I started actively looking at my own life with more awareness, I noticed that I'd be out downtown seeing other people eating donuts or drinking a milkshake and thinking, oh my gosh, that looks so good. I really miss eating those tasty things. But the other part of the package deal was missing. Sure, before carnivore, I was freely eating those so-called tasty things, but I was also suffering from bleeding bowels severe acid reflux, tonsil stones. Funny how my brain had forgotten all that. Never allow the good and the bad to become separate. Once you've made the decision not to eat foods like cake anymore because of its impact on your health, it's not a good idea to let yourself keep thinking thoughts that fuel a desire for it. My experience with carnivore during this last pregnancy made me realize that when I'm left to the modern world without boundaries and without intention, I will eventually return to having an affection for modern foods as my default state. I think this is true for most of us. Make the effort to supervise the thoughts in your brain. Do not let yourself fantasize about certain aspects of your previous life eating modern foods, forgetting all the costs and what that food did to your body and your mind. At the same time, make the effort to cultivate gratitude for the carnivore foods that you are eating. Every time you cook up a steak, Take a moment to feel appreciation for the opportunity to eat the healthiest, most nourishing food on earth. Not everyone gets to eat this way. And while that is sometimes easy to forget, I personally don't ever want to take that for granted.